Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Pastor Daniel Dagan here. Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. We welcome you to our Friday 1 p.m. Prop Prophecy Live Bible Study. Prophecy Live Bible Study. We'll give everybody a moment to join us here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Hallelujah, mighty God. We give you praise. We give you praise, God. You're worthy. We want to start today by taking some prayer requests and praying over some different things. And it's good to have you joining us. We're glad some others are coming on now. And we just we want to pray over a pastor friend of mine by the name of Scott Wilson. And we know the prayer list is endless with this COVID. But this is a man that's um Pastor, the church my wife was raised up in in Gonzales, Louisiana, Prairieville area for a number of years. And he um, prayed a prayer over me when I was in a very sick place and a, a difficult place in my life. And it really was instrumental to my life. I want to pray over Scott Wilson. Many other prayer needs here. Can you pray with me right now? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I thank you, mighty God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your love and for your kindness. Father, thank you for the responsibility and the awesome privilege, God, to be able to share thy word and study it together. Father, I pray touch this today. God, be exalted. Give us clarity of mind, clarity of speech, clarity of thought. Anoint the speaker and yea, the hearer today. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for touching every prayer need today. In Jesus' mighty name, we humbly pray. Amen, amen, amen. Good to see you with us, Brother Ray, Sister Hudson, Brother Donald, others. We want to begin today. Today we'll do part two of a series I started last Friday, 1 p.m. Again, the Friday 1 p.m. teaching focuses upon what I call Prophecy Live. It's all subjects and elements related to eschatology or end time prophecy. And we've been teaching now last Friday today on the subject of the first resurrection, the subject of the first resurrection. And just to review in Revelations 20, verse four to six, I'm not going to read it again now, but it speaks of a first resurrection and those that have part in that are blessed. Well, some teachers, especially those that hold the view that the church is raptured after the seven years of tribulation, after what's called Daniel's 70th week. Some of those teachers, I've heard many of them say this, write it, and otherwise say that that, Revelations 24 through 6, shows that all believers are resurrected precisely at that exact moment of Revelations 20, 4 through 6, yea, what's called there the first resurrection, and that's after the seven years of tribulation, thus the church goes through the seven years of tribulation. Well, that's an incorrect, incorrect interpretation of Revelations 24 through 6. Last week, I taught about an hour and 10 minutes on it. I want to continue teaching on it today. We want to make some introductory comments here as we get in to this. Um, there's a clear biblical teaching of a resurrection of the just and of the unjust, a resurrection to life, a resurrection to judgment. We went through many passages last Friday dealing with that. Many passages, about seven or eight in the Old Testament, likewise in the New Testament. So every person, yea, the dead and the living, will be resurrected from this life into the next life. They will go into those that are just, 
into a resurrection of life, yea, unto Jesus. Those that are unjust, not saved, do not serve God, unto that resurrection, unto the second death, ultimately, ultimately, into the second death after the great white throne judgment. Well, we want to go a little bit deeper here. All the unsaved or those unjust of all time. I will teach a lesson on the great white throne judgment later on this same time slot Friday at 1. But all of the unjust, the unsaved from every dispensation, from Cain forward until the end of time, every unsaved person will stay in the grave until the end. Revelations 20, verse 11 to 15. At that time, all the unsaved, the unredeemed, the dead, spiritually dead, unredeemed, will be brought forth to the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment, I will teach a lesson on it, but it's a, it's a time in which all of the unsaved at all time will be judged. It will be judged. Let me also just make another comment here as we get deeper into today's subject of the first resurrection. There is um, many passages in the Old Testament that deals with the resurrection. And it ties these two statements, a resurrection of the just and the unjust, together. It ties them together. We went through it in detail last week. And it seems like if you read them, Job talks about it, Isaiah talks about it, Psalms talks about it multiple places. If you read them, it seems almost like by the language of the Old Testament that those two things take place at the same time. But then, as it were, you get into the New Testament and more details given, more explanations given. That makes sense, right? Just like the subject of church age salvation. Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, yea, with the sign of tongues, church age salvation. Well, we do see that in pieces, prophetically, in types and shadows in the Old Testament, I agree. But it's not made absolutely clear until Calvary, death, burial, resurrection, and then it's preached, Acts 2.38, at the birth of the church. So it's not uncommon for a subject to be talked about and we're given uh, bits and pieces of it in the Old Testament. And then we come to the New Testament and it literally is opened up or becomes more clear. We see that with salvation. We see that with end time prophecy on a broad sense. Remember Daniel? He looks forward and sees some things broadly. But then we have the benefit now as New Testament church age believers of all of what takes place in the 27 New Testament books. Yea, the Olivet Discourse, all of Paul's writings to the church of Thessalonica, everything that's said in the book of Revelation, and so forth. Revelation, it's been said by commentaries, the book of Revelation, it's been said by commentary, commentaries and scholars that it fills in the gaps left by the book of Daniel. It paints in between the broad brushstrokes of prophecy that Daniel gave, gave us. It gives us more detail. So we do see on those subjects, salvation and time prophecy, that in the Old Testament, much information is given, but it's not always as clear as we would like it to be if we just read the pages of the Old Testament. But then when we get into the New Testament, the name of Jesus, the incarnation is another point of that. When you get into the New Testament, it's unfolded, becomes more clear. Well, the same thing can be said when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. When you read in the Old Testament, you read uh, multiple places about the resurrection of the just and of the unjust. One example is Daniel 12. The resurrection of the just and the unjust. And it seems like it's going to happen at the same time. A simultaneous resurrection or harvest. But that's not true when you get into the New Testament. It's absolutely clear in the New Testament that all of the unjust people, the unsaved people, the unredeemed people from every dispensation, from every age, from Cain until the end of time, all of the unsaved, unredeemed people will stay in the grave. Call it Hades, call it Shoals, call it Tartarus. 
They will stay there in the grave, the resting of the dead man's soul, until the end of time, yea, the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 to 15, when the dead, the unredeemed of all time, will be judged. And then when you get into the New Testament, we see this description of the resurrection of the just. Okay, let me just make this statement again to repeat what I said last week at the end of the lesson. The resurrection of the just. Every believer that is saved in their dispensation or time period, when they die, they're saved according to the time period that they live in. For the church, you must come to Acts 2.38. You must continue on until the end. Be faithful until the end. For every believer that's saved when they die, or yea, at the rapture, every believer will, they will be judged based upon the truth given to that dispensation. And no believers will have to go to the great white throne judgment. We will not stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment. That is a judgment only for the unsaved of all time. Okay? Every believer that is resurrected will take part in a phase of the first resurrection. The opening verse today, Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. You're blessed if you have part in the first resurrection. Amen. I agree a hundred percent. Every believer that is resurrected, part of the resurrection of the just, part of the resurrection unto life, every believer will be part of that first resurrection. I agree with that. That is a biblical statement. This is why I disagree with post-tribulation rapture teachers. The first resurrection, all of it, does not take place precisely in the one moment of time of Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6, after the seven years of tribulation. There's phases, phases, or different moments, phases of the first resurrection. With that, let me go to 1 Corinthians 15, 23, and 24, and then we're going to give you several examples of people that are resurrected, groups, if you will, that are resurrected prior to before, prior to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 to 6. 1 Corinthians 15, 23, 24. Can I have an amen if you're with me? Sister Tony, Sister Diane, great to have you with us. Sister Felicia, Sister Alexis, pray all you folks are doing good today. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 24. It's a great book, probably the most extensive look at what happens when you die in terms of the resurrection. This chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, probably the most extensive look at what happens when you die. It leads off with Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection. Talked about that a lot last week. Go back and listen to it if you missed it. But it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 24, after Jesus, the first fruits of the resurrection rises, Jesus, the one that says he was the resurrection, rose on the third day. It says in verse 23, every man... In his own order, Christ, the first fruits, yea, of the resurrection. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. They that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he have put down all rule and authority and power. So verse 23, 24, speaking of, Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection. Study the broader passage in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. We taught it last week. That's why it says in Matthew 27, 50 to 53, that Jesus uh, died upon the cross. When he dies, the earth begins to shake. The rocks of all those graves begin to move. But then nobody came out of the graves until when? The third day. When Jesus, the first fruits of the erection, came back to life, resurrected himself, he said, you destroy this body, the temple, I will rise it up. He resurrects himself, and then many, the Bible says, many, the Bible says, Matthew 27, <clears throat> verse 15, 51, many of the saints which slept arose and went into that holy city. So Jesus was the first fruits, but right behind him, what do we see? We see many of the Old Testament saints, it doesn't say all, it says many. Many of the Old Testament saints were resurrected on the third day when Jesus 
comes forth as the first fruits of the resurrection than many other saints, also Old Testament saints, Matthew 27, 50 to 51, are resurrected. Okay, everybody after their own order. So when I say every believer that is a believer that's saved when they die or yea, is saved now as a church age believer, we're alive, the dead in Christ. If Jesus comes right now, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain are saved or called up to meet him in the air. Every believer has part in the first resurrection. They're blessed, they're just, they're saved, they have part in the first resurrection. But the first resurrection does not just focus upon everybody being resurrected precisely at one second or moment of time in Revelation chapter 24 to 6 after the seven years of tribulation. Matthew 27 shows us that many Old Testament saints, as the law passes and we go towards grace, many Old Testament saints that were dead, asleep in the grave, dead, they came out of the graves and they were resurrected, your Bible says, and went into the holy city. So Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Everybody that's a believer will be resurrected after their own order, is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Or after their own order, time period, might I, might I say. Let's continue moving. Uh, I just went through with you again about Matthew 27, how many of the Old Testament saints there were resurrected. Uh, I just quoted to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, how it speaks of the church, the church, the bride of Christ being raptured. Well, I've taught previously extensively, extensively on this same time slot. You could go back to mid-March and look up the lessons from Friday, 1 p.m. on the same Facebook page. I've taught extensively why the Bible declares a church will be raptured before the tribulation. Extensively. I um, have a 65-page lesson on that one point in my book on end time prophecy, The Unveiling. So I've taught about that a lot. The church is clearly raptured before the seven years of tribulation. I'm not going to reteach that, but that's another example. Have you also thought about this? Can you go with me? Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 4. Can you go with me to Revelation 4? Here's another group that you see in heaven prior to Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. I'm going to give you several examples of people and groups that are clearly resurrected as believers, saved, the just. Those that will be with Jesus for eternity. I'm going to give you several examples of those that were resurrected prior to the end of the seven years of tribulation. Yea, prior to the passage of Revelation 20 verse 4 to 6. Why am I going through all of this? Why am I giving you so many examples of people that are resurrected prior to the end of the seven years of tribulation? This is why. If a biblical conclusion, somebody offers a conclusion. If that contradicts anything else in the Bible, that conclusion's wrong. Or minimally, it is, it is impartial in its summation. People that teach post-tribulation rapture, many of them have written, have said in teaching, I've heard it, I've read it, have books behind me to prove it. They have said that the church will be raptured or resurrected as part of what takes place in the recording of Revelation 24 to 6. Everybody that's saved part of the first resurrection will be part of that. That's simply wrong. There's many, many examples of people being resurrected prior to Revelation 24 through 6, prior to the end of the seven years of tribulation. Here's another one. You read in, in Revelation 4 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Can you say amen? If you're with me. Revelations 4, verse 1. This is what John, the beloved, yea, the apostle, is given the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the first three chapters of Revelation, you read the word church and churches 21 times. In the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, you read the word church and churches 21 times times in the King James Version. In verse 1 of Revelation 4, John, a member of the church, 
is taken up. It's a type of, if you will, the catching the way of the church. He's taken up into heaven. From there, as you begin to get into the tribulation passages, Revelation chapter 6 to 18, that records the tribulation passages, the seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. Guess how many times you read of the word church in those chapters, Revelation 6 to 18. Guess how many times you read the word churches in Revelation chapter 6 to 18. That's right, a big fat zero, not one time. 21 times you read about the church in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. And then when you get into the tribulation passages that deals with what happens over those seven years, of which some says the church is present and goes through it, you don't read about the church being mentioned one time. Why is that? Because the church is not here. Revelation 4, 1, a member of the church is taken up, yea, into heaven. It says in verse 2, and John says, I, John, was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set upon the throne. Jump down to verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. You could do an extensive study just on this one point, but, but I want you to see. As we deal with today, the truth that every believer from the different dispensations of time that will be resurrected, every believer that is saved, redeemed from the different dispensations of time that will be resurrected, they will be part of the resurrection of the just, resurrection of life, yea, the first blessed resurrection. But everybody's not resurrected precisely at the same exact time. That's what I'm dealing with. Paul writes and speaks of everybody being resurrected after their own order. After their own order. Well, here we see as John, a member of the church, is seen taken up to heaven. He's in heaven. He sees in heaven, in heaven, prior to the beginning of the passages that chronicalize in great detail, chapter 6 to 18, the tribulation events. John is seen in heaven. And yea, the four and twenty elders are seen in heaven. Have you ever wondered who's the four and twenty elders? Well, you don't have to wonder. The Bible spells it out. I'm not going to go there and read it, but I'll give it to you for your reference sake. When you see in Revelations 21, verse 12 to 14, the 12 heads of the tribes of Israel are listed in the 12 uh, original foundational apostles from the end of Acts 1 are listed in the foundations of heaven, yea, in the gates of the city. That's the four and twenty elders that we see gathered around the throne. And oh yeah, they, they have seats. They have seats. It's a lesson for another day. But they have seats around the throne. So you see Israel, the original heads of the twelve tribes, and the original beginning of the New Testament church, Remember, Jesus said that this church is built upon who? The apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It all begins with Jesus, the chief cornerstone, but then after that, the apostles and prophets. So the apostles and prophets as the 12 tribes of Israel, the heads, begins the nation of Israel. The apostles begins the church, begins the church. They're all present in the upper room. It begins with the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that's the four and twenty elders. And you see them already in heaven. Already in heaven. Why is that? Because what we already went through. Matthew 27 verse 50. Many of the Old Testament saints was resurrected, went into the holy city at the time of Jesus' resurrection. I see that as the twelve heads of the tribes of Israel. Also, uh, the church has been raptured prior to the seven years of tribulation. That agrees with the church not going through the wrath in about eight different passages in the New Testament. That agrees with John, a member of the church, being in heaven prior to the tribulation passages, Revelation 6 to 18. That agrees with the four and twenty elders, the twelve apostles, foundational apostles from the end of Acts 1. 
and the 12 heads of Israel being in heaven before the tribulation passages begin. So they were already resurrected prior to, prior to the precise moment referenced in Revelation chapter 24 through 6. Were they part of the first resurrection? Absolutely they were. Were they resurrected at the precise second of time after the seven years of tribulation after Armageddon in Revelation 24 through 6? No, because there's orders to this phases to the first resurrection. Every man resurrected after his own order, his own order. And that's speaking of phases or different orders, different moments of the first resurrection of the just, the resurrection of life. All of those that are going to be resurrected as part of the resurrection of death or of the unjust that will pass before the great white throne, Revelations 20, 11 to 15, and be pronounced into Guiana, the lake of fire, the second death with a false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan will be, all of those people will be in the grave, the resting of the dead man's soul until, until the time of Revelation 20, 11. That's true for the resurrection of the unjust. But it's not true for the resurrection of the just. There's many phases to the resurrection of the just. We continue moving here today. A lot of information I want to move through. I'd like to finish this lesson today so we could get into the marriage supper of the Lamb and the beam of the judgment seat of Christ next Friday. Let's talk about the two witnesses. Now, I'm going to give you a lot of verses today. I'm not going to read every single one of them, but I'll give you a lot of verses. The two witnesses, you remember we taught on them a few weeks ago. I taught about how I feel it's some type of manifestation, if you will, of Elijah and Moses. Taught about that extensively. Go back and watch it. But what happens after the bodies lay in the streets for three days? God raises them up, right? Revelations 11, verse 3 to 14. And then they go into they go into a heaven. They go to be with Jesus in the presence of the Lord. Yea, Abraham's bosom. They go in there with him. The two witnesses are resurrected. That's a resurrection. It's a resurrection, clearly. I do want to read a couple of these. Acts chapter 7. Can you go with me? Acts chapter 7. Here's a New Testament church age believer filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 on down. This is where Stephen, one of the seven deacons, Stephen and Philip, probably the most notable of the deacons. Uh, uh, Stephen, one of the seven deacons, is, is literally being stoned because of his obedience to Jesus, following Jesus and doing what Jesus would have him to do. In the midst of those stoning him, there's a young man by the name of Saul, becomes Paul the great apostle. Study for another day. Acts 7, 55 down to verse 59. I want you to hear what it says at the end of this, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but just notice what it says as he's being stoned in verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So he literally foresaw himself as he took his last breath, his spirit's going back to be with Jesus. He's not waiting. His spirit's going back to be with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The spirit returns to Jesus when you die. Now, yes, I agree. Your physical body as a believer stays in the grave until the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church takes place, I taught a lesson on this. What happens when you die? Probably a month ago, the same time slot. When you die... As a believer, your body goes to the grave. Your spirit returns and is with Jesus. And then at the rapture of the church, what happens? A dead in Christ rise first. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40 down. They lay down, leave there their earthly body. They rise of the heavenly body. They leave there the terrestrial body, tangible, physical. They rise with the celestial body. 
they leave their natural, they rise with the spiritual body. Some type of spiritual silhouette, heavenly body. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it won't be flesh and bones. Well, at the rapture of the church, your spirit, if you die prior to the rapture, your spirit goes and is with Jesus. But at the rapture moment, twinkle of an eye, your spirit and your body rise together. Much like what happened when you really get into the intricacies of Jesus in the third day resurrection. So, but Stephen died. His spirit went to be with Jesus. It's a type of, it's a type of. Have you considered the thief on the cross? Luke 23, verse 43. Luke 23, verse 43. You remember? Jesus is there. He's hanging between two male factors, your Bible says. Some moron said, teaching a lesson, that just is a fact that they're two males. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The two thieves, that's what that word male factor means. The two thieves. And Jesus is outside the gates of the city, and he's hanging between the two thieves. And as he's hanging between the two thieves, he is there. And he turns to the one, Luke 23, 43. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the same type of thing. Today you will be with me in paradise. I see that playing out. And as Jesus comes forth as a resurrection, many of those saints rise. And, and there's a big celebration in Abraham's bosom. This guy was part of all of that. The work of Calvary and what Jesus done there. Today, 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 he said. And then you get into another example. There's many. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31. Let's go there. Luke 16, verse 19 down to verse 31. I'm giving you many examples. I'm going quickly here. Going quickly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We're going quickly trying to share as much as we can. Trying to be a blessing we want to help people understand the word of God and try to do it with the right spirit. Lord, we need your mercy. Luke chapter 16, verse 19, down to verse 31. Luke 16, 19 to 31, it's not a parable. Okay, this is a story of Lazarus the beggar, you remember, and the rich man, and they both die, and Lazarus the beggar is carried away to Abraham's bosom. The rich man is taken to a place of torment. He's crying out, there it is, crying out, for one drop of water. And as he's doing that, the story begins to unfold, okay? Well, let me just make a comment. Luke 16, 19 to 31, this passage, Lazarus the beggar, the rich man, both die. It's not a parable. It's not a parable, okay? People have explained this before, and I understand people have a zeal for God, not according to knowledge. I don't mean to be harsh, with any comment about somebody that doesn't understand. But I've heard people explain this before, that, that this is a parable. It's not a parable. Why can I say that? Because when you get into the intricacies of the passage, the, one of the main key central figures of the story is a guy by the name of Lazarus, the beggar. When you study parables, specific names are not given in parables. If you read a specific name, that disqualifies it from being a parable. A parable... It, it's it's a, a fictional story that communicates eternal truths with metaphors and allegories and symbolisms. Yes, there's truths in a parable, but a parable, as you read in the Bible, it's not a truth telling in terms of a recounting of actual acts and events that took place before the teller of the parable. It is a story that is fictional in that it never took place with actual key figures and individuals, but it communicates an internal truth. That's what a parable is. This is not a parable. Why do I say that? Because it includes the names of specific individuals. It's a literal recounting. Beyond that, there's references to Moses and the prophets and the law. This is clearly given on the backdrop of Judaism, to predominantly Jewish listeners for a lesson. It's a truth, a story that actually took place. With that being said, you get into it and you read about Lazarus. Okay, Lazarus dies and he's taken to Abraham's bosom. According to New Unger's Bible Dictionary, 
It's a very respected Bible dictionary. Unger's is very respected when it comes to scholarly work on the Bible. It's described Abraham's bosom in this regard. Jesus is talking to Jewish people in the Talmud, the recording of the oral Jewish law. This expression speaks of a state of bliss after death. To the Jewish mind, Father Abraham is seen pictured at the gate of paradise, ready to embrace his children as they enter in. The whole family is said to gather together and be embracing in his arms. Thus, you read about the language of John 13, 25, John 21, 20, where you see John, the beloved, with his head on the bosom of Jesus. That's a type pointing to the type of Jewish thought and appreciation and embrace, yea, that will be experienced at Abraham's bosom. It's, it's commented that it's there just outside the gates of ultimately what becomes New Jerusalem later in the book of Revelation. Well, Lazarus the beggar is carried to that place. And on the backdrop of the Talmud and the language of the Talmud with Abraham and Moses and the law of Moses, he gives them this truth story, this story that literally took place. My point is that you see Lazarus there in Abraham's bosom, Abraham's bosom, okay? Hallelujah. And then you have other examples, Enoch, Enoch. The Bible says of Enoch, for he was not, for God took him. He was not, for God took him. Forgive me, that was an amber alert. God touched the situation with that child in Jesus' name. But Enoch was not, for God took him. That's another example, a little bit unique. I understand Elijah, the world when the fire taken up. That's another example. But, but my point is in covering all of those examples that there's many illustrations, including the rapture of the New Testament church prior to the wrath. There's many illustrations and examples of resurrections, if I can say it as raptures, prior to Revelations 20, verse 4 to 6, prior to the precise moment after the seven years of tribulation. Many examples of the just being resurrected to life. Many phases after their own order as it's talked about. Let me talk now about just for another moment here, about some of the other Old Testament believers that will be resurrected. Some of the other Old Testament believers that will be resurrected. I've already been through here today and last week in great detail that many of the Old Testament saints were resurrected when you read Matthew 27, 50 to 51, 52. Okay, but then there's some other ones. There's some other ones that's not resurrected until the end. Until the time after the wrath. I agree with that. That's scriptural. There's some other Old Testament. That's the key. Everybody that's part of the church. When, do I, when, when did the church begin? Clearly it begins at Acts chapter 2. That's the birthplace of the church. Okay. Prior to that, they're still under the law. Up until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? So the church begins in Acts 2. The church, yea, the church age, the church goes up until the rapture of the church. Everybody that's part of the rapture of the church, every church age believer, if they've died and if they're alive at the time Jesus comes in the air, every church age believer is taken up. The, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain caught up to meet them in the air. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Everybody part of that, the rapture of the church, hear the language, is part of the bride, part of the bride of Christ. And only the bride of Christ is celebrated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Next Friday, 1 p.m., I will get into two points that are tied closely together. The marriage supper of the Lamb, which celebrates the bridegroom. Remember the parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and the bride, the church. The church in New Testament language is identified as the bride. That coming together takes place. It's a process, I agree. But that coming together takes place ultimately at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll also talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Both of those happen next week in our teaching. The judgment seat of Christ, it's not 
thumbs, thumbs up. You're judged to be good and righteous and saved. Go to heaven with Jesus for eternity. Thumbs down, burn, you're going to hell. That's not what the judgment seat of Christ is at all. Every person that appears before the judgment seat of Christ is saved, period. No question about it. Judgment seat of Christ is a place of rewarding. It's where you get your, might I say, crown, spiritual authorities, that type of honoring that's given out at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul deals with that uh, several different places in his writings. We'll deal with those things next week. Okay, the great white throne judgment is where all the unsaved of all time will be judged. But everybody that's part of the church will be raptured as part of the bride, will be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb as a celebrated guest. I view them as a seated, celebrated guest. Old Testament saints, many of them, how many is that? I have no idea. But many of them, your Bible says many. Many of them will be resurrected in the time Jesus resurrects himself on the third day, Matthew 27, 50 to 52. In that group, I do see the uh, 12 heads of the tribes of Israel because they're seen repeatedly already being in heaven, in heaven um, and many others. Okay, now it's unique. David is not part of the resurrection of the many Old Testament saints that you read about in Matthew 27. He's one of those Old Testament saints that will wait until after the wrath, until after the seven years. Yea, Revelations 20. When you get into uh, Acts 2, somewhere around about verse 28, you read that David's not yet been resurrected. David waits. So there's some Old Testament saints that's not resurrected in the group of many. It says in Matthew 27, they will wait until after the wrath, until after the indignation, until after Jacob's trouble. I'm going to get into the explanation of this right now. Okay. Clearly, the Old Testament saints, though they didn't clearly understand the specifics of the resurrection of the just and how all that would lay out, they clearly anticipated a resurrection, a resurrection of the dead for the just and the unjust. And you see this is highlighted by the language in Hebrews 11. Can I have an amen if you're with me? Sister Pamela, great to have you with us. Sister Beverly, great to have you with us. Sister Tony, I love to see when you folks put the city or state, country you're listening from. I love to see that. And then we always covet and desire your prayers. Please also share these teachings and, and I, I want to get the word out there. That's, that's how we're rewarded for a time investment to do this to help those people we pastor, this community, and others with God's Word. Hebrews chapter 11, some comments here really highlights the anticipation and expectation that the Old Testament saints had for this resurrection, for this, this resurrection of the just, of the saved, this resurrection of life. Hear the language. In Hebrews 11, verse, verse uh, 13 and 14, Speaking of the Hall of Fame of the Old Testament saints and men and women of God celebrated by their faith that lived in the Old Testament, Paul continues writing. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them from afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. What country is that? Jump down to 16. Now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. So a prepared city. You read the same language in John 14. Preparing a place, a prepared city. Jump down to verse 35. Again, it accentuates the truth that the Old Testament saints were expecting, looking for more than just being blessed in this life, they were looking for a resurrection from the dead for the just, for those living. Talked about that in detail last week. I'm just giving you some New Testament references here to it. Hebrews 11, verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That's talking about literally a physical death. You think about the widow's child coming back and 
some of these examples, uh, a resurrection back to a physical life. But then it goes on. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain. Here it is, a better resurrection. So they were anticipating a better resurrection. Let's go now to Daniel 12 and verse uh, 1 and 2. Daniel 12 and verse 1 and 2. Again, I'm dealing with the subject of the first resurrection. And precisely, we're given many examples. I've been through most of the list at this point in the teaching. Given many examples of people that will be resurrected prior to the precise moment in time of Revelations 24 through 6 after the seven years of tribulation. Yes, every believer has part in and is part of the blessed first resurrection. But I refute, I stand against the thought that everybody will be resurrected precisely at the same time. It's not true. It's not true. People play games with simultaneous harvest and some of these things. Those passages, when you really dig into them, it does not stand up to the scrutiny. It does not stand up to the scrutiny. So we've been given examples that there's many resurrections, types of resurrections prior to the passage of Revelation 20, verse 4. From the time Jesus rises as the first resurrection up until Revelation 24 through 6, there's many different orders or phases of the resurrection, yea, the first resurrection. When we look at the Old Testament saints, many of them are resurrected when Jesus is resurrected, Matthew 27, but then some wait, some Old Testament saints will wait until after, after the seven years of wrath, indignation, Jacob's trouble to be resurrected. Why is that? It's fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Stay with me. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Hold on to that statement, trouble. That's speaking, that is speaking of the seven years of tribulation. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even until the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. That's speaking of the 144,000 sealed Jews from the seven years of tribulation, every one that shall be found written in the book. Okay? And then it gets into this resurrection. And many of them, many of them, those that are found written in the book, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, that's the ones that are dead, that's the Old Testament saints that are dead, that are found written in the book of life, that are saved, but they're in the ground. They're in the ground, okay? And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There you see in verse 2 of Daniel 12. So there will be after a time of trouble. Some of these Old Testament saints will stay in the grave until after that, after Jacob's trouble, after the seven years of tribulation. They will stay in the grave and then they will be resurrected. And they will be resurrected in the precise moment of time of Revelations 24 through 6. And then those that are not saved, the unjust, those, those Jews that worship pagans and, and, and idols and heathens and all of that type of sinfulness, they will stay there in the grave. And then at the great white throne judgment, all of them, yea, all the dead, the unsaved, the unredeemed of all time, will come amidst them will be the unsaved Old Testament people. They will come to a resurrection of shame and everlasting contempt. Let's continue on. Okay, so there you see after the time of trouble, some of these Old Testament saints will be resurrected unto a resurrection of life. They will be resurrected there at that precise moment, Revelations 24 through 6. Can I have an amen if you're with me here? Sister Kim, Brother Louis, good to have you folks with us. <clears throat> Continuing talking about the first resurrection and how every believer will be part of the first resurrection, yea, blessed. But I stand against, I refute 
that the first resurrection, 100% of it, takes place precisely at that exact moment recorded in Revelation 24 through 6 after the seven years of tribulation. Stand against that. That's errant teaching. I went through last Friday and today already the last 45 minutes, several examples of people of resurrections prior to, prior to Revelations 20. People that were resurrected as part of the resurrection of life, resurrection of just, the resurrection of believers, yea, part of the first resurrection. I repeat, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 24 speaks of, after Jesus, the first fruits of the resurrection comes forth, then every believer, every man after his own order. So there's phases or different orders or different segments of the first resurrection. It all does not happen at the same time. Now I'm speaking of the, the Old Testament saints, believers, believers, Old Testament saints. Many of them are resurrected when Jesus resurrects himself in Matthew 27. We talked about that. Some of them, Old Testament saints, do wait until Revelations 20, verse 4 to 6, after the seven years of tribulation, wrath, Jacob's trouble, indignation, to be resurrected unto the resurrection of life. And this is what confuses some of the post-tribulation teachers and why they try to lump the church into that uh, time period of going through the seven years and being resurrected in Revelations 20. These, these passages I'm giving you now. Just went through Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Let's go here now to Job 14. Job 14, verse 10 to 14. And you have a comment or question? Uh, you know, I don't really like you to post them on Facebook. It's not the, the venue for that. Email it to me, pastordagan at gmail.com. And if it's a legitimate question and you have your pastor's blessing, if you attend an apostolic church, get your pastor's blessing before you contact me. But if you'll email it to me in kind, I will respond to you in kind and in a thorough answer. Job 14, verse 10 to 14. I want you to hear the language here. Let me just hasten down to verse 13. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. Job, a Jewish Old Testament believer, lesson for another day. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret. Here it is. Until thy wrath be past, and that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. And if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. So Job prophetically stepping into the office of a prophet a little bit here, even an end time prophet. And he foresees after a time of wrath, after an appointed time, he will be resurrected. His change will come. He will be called forth out of the place of deadness, yea, out of the grave, out of souls. He will be called forth out of that place. So when you take the word wrath there and you hold it and you tie it to the word Daniel 12, 1 and 2, trouble, and then we keep working forward, okay? We keep working forward and you think about what what Jacob said or what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 35 to 7, a time of Jacob's trouble, all of a sudden you begin to see that some of the Old Testament saints will be resurrected unto life after the seven years of tribulation, after the time of trouble, after a time of Jacob's trouble, after a time of wrath. And then Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 19 to 21, I'm not going to read it, but Isaiah 26, 19 to 21, in almost the same exact language, it speaks of after the time of the indignation, the, the saints, some of the Old Testament saints, will be resurrected unto life. When you think of the word indignation, that's used in association with the seven years of tribulation, get into Daniel, some other things that Paul writes, and you can see that. So it is clear that some Old Testament saints that die, they will be resurrected. They were, they were resurrected when Jesus came out of the tomb on the third day. I've already talked about that in detail. But then some others, in them was David. You could read through Acts chapter 2, verse 27 down, and you can read about David being in that latter group 
I don't know why some was resurrected on the third day with Jesus and some others wait. Um, but David clearly is in that latter group. The 12 heads of Israel is in the first group because they're seen multiple times in heaven when you read through Revelations 4 and Revelations 5 prior to the tribulation beginning in Revelation 6. So there's some Old Testament saints that stay in the grave and they will be resurrected as part of the resurrection of the just unto life precisely at the exact moment of time that Revelation 24 through 6 speaks of. But there's several resurrections of others prior to that. I've gone through all the verses today. Go back and listen if you didn't hear it. Let me just put a bow on. Let me just put a bow on the resurrection of the Old Testament saints after the seven years of tribulation. Let me just put a bow on that right now. Are you with me? Can I have an amen? Give me an amen. Let me know you're with me. We're really getting into the Bible now today. Let me really just get a good, strong amen from somebody if you're with me. Plus, I need a drink of water. Let me wait for your amen here. Okay, so let me just put a bow on this on this uh, thought that some Old Testament saints was resurrected. Matthew 27, when Jesus comes out as a first fruit on the third day. And some others, so, so Cece, good to have you with us, friend. Some others were resurrected. Old Testament saints will be resurrected coming up in the future in Revelations 24 through 6 at that precise moment of time after the seven years of tribulation. I've been through it. Let me just put a bow on it. Okay. When you get into the Olivet Discourse, I like to go to Matthew 24. It's also recorded in Mark 13 and Luke 21. But when you get into the Olivet Discourse, it's the most expensive look at end time prophecy during the teaching earthly ministry of Jesus Christ over his three and a half years of public ministry. Okay, It's given to answer three questions. When shall these things be? Matthew 24, 3. What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the sign of the end of the world? In response to those three questions, we're given this great dialogue of end time prophecy and exposition by Jesus. I'm going to teach probably... Two or three lessons just on the Olivet Discourse. People butcher it. They try to place the church in the Olivet Discourse late in the passage, okay? I absolutely see the church in the Olivet Discourse. I see the church present. Matthew 24, verse 1, down up into verse 8, verse 9. I see the church present for all of that. From, from verse 9, verse 10 forward, I don't read of the church at all. I don't see the church present at all. It's, it's a, frankly speaking, it's an irresponsible interpretation of the passage. People hold on to the word elect in Matthew 24, and they try to relate it to the church. And it's true that word does relate to the church at times, but it also relates to Israel. You have to, and I'm making comments now um, over here. I'll get back to the Olivet Discourse in the in future lessons, but let me just finish a comment. People try to relate the word elect to the church. In an absolute sense, you can't do that. The word elect does not always relate to the church or Israel. It relates to both. You have to let the text interpretate how it relates and what it's saying. The word saint does not always relate to the church. It doesn't always relate to Israel. You have to let the text interpretate the text. The Bible is the greatest commentary on the Bible. The Bible is the greatest interpretator on the Bible. The word wrath does not always point towards the seven years of tribulation, okay? I could go on and on with all of those types of comments. But the word elect that you read in the Olivet Discourse, verse 22, Matthew 24, verse 24, Matthew 24, it's clear to me when you read Isaiah 65, verse 9, and Isaiah 45, 4, that's clearly talking about Israel. It is speaking of Israel. When you consider Matthew as a gospel that's targeted to the Jews, and that, that point is not refuted by scholars. I agree every word in the Bible helps every single person that's ever been alive. Amen. Can we just agree to agree on that point? But Matthew is precisely targeted to the Jews. You can read the stories, you can read the language, you can read the type of points that are brought out, and so forth. It's targeted to the Jews. Matthew was a Jew, 
Okay, as we study through this, they're standing upon the Old Testament law. When you read the Olivet Discourse over and over, you read a reference as it ties, especially from verse 11, 12 down, you read of references that ties it to Israel, to Israel. Uh, when you read statements in verse 14, gospel of the kingdom, anybody that knows anything about that statement knows that refers to Israel. That's a reference to the millennial kingdom. That's not the gospel that Paul preached, death, burial, resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's not what Paul's speaking of in Galatians 1, 8, and 9. If I or an angel come from heaven preaching another gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus preached it early in the gospels. It's a gospel offered to the Jews about the Jews, about the kingdom being restored to the Jews. That's a Jewish reference. Matthew 24, 15, abomination, desolation, Jewish reference. By who? Daniel. Daniel's mentioned in verse 15, Matthew 24. Daniel's a prophet to Israel. He sees the time of the Jews from the, the a covenant up until the, the covenant that allowed the Jews to leave Babylonian captivity up until the time of the cutting off of the Antichrist, uh, of Christ. Uh, at the cross of Calvary, 483 years. And then he sees from there the seven years where the covenant is made with the Antichrist. Daniel is a prophet to Israel. He sees those 490 years, Daniel 73, 483 years from the time in which there was an agreement offered by heathen kings that allows the Jews to go back and rebuild the city and the temple up until the cutting off of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Calvary. And then he jumps over the church age and sees the last seven years, the seven years of tribulation, which focuses upon Israel and the covenant the Antichrist makes with Israel. Daniel is a prophet to Israel. You see all of this in Matthew 24, the holy place. That's a reference to the temple, Israel, Judea, verse 16. That's a reference to Israel. The Sabbath day, verse 20. That's a reference to Israel. The elect, that's a reference to Israel. And when you get deeper, the 12 tribes, verse 30, that's a reference to Israel. The fig tree is clearly Israel, verse 32 on down. Matthew 24, verse 9, 10 on down deals with Israel. Now, to get to my closing point, get to my closing point. I was saying that the Old Testament saints, many of them, was resurrected on the third day in Matthew 27, verse 50. When Jesus came out of the tomb, many of the dead Old Testament saints were resurrected. Many, some of the Old Testament saints that were saved, redeemed, part of, will be part of the resurrection of the just unto life, were not resurrected in Matthew 27, verse 50. They'll stay in the grave, no punishment, no suffering. They'll stay in the grave until the precise moment of time Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6 speaks of. After, after, as we've read, the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, after the wrath, after the appointed time, after the time of the indignation. Five references that places a resurrection of some, many, some of the Old Testament saints after the seven years, after Daniel's 70th week. But many of the Old Testament saints was resurrected in Matthew 27, according to scripture. Okay, let's put a bow on that point as I finish the lesson today in the teaching last Friday and today on the first resurrection. Okay, as I just went through that lengthy explanation quickly, and I'm going to get into a lengthy verse by verse teaching on Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse in the weeks to come. But I just went through all of that to prove to you, to show you that from verse 9, 10 of Matthew 24 on down, until the end of the parable of the fig tree, verse 36, that deals with that is pointed towards, prophecies pointed towards Israel. I've had people try to place the church um, at the end of uh, this passage in verse 29, saying that proves that the church goes through the tribulation. It's wrong. It's clearly wrong, blatantly wrong. Verse 29, seeing that this relates to Israel, hear the language of verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun of, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and shall then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and sh they shall see the Son of Man coming 
in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven unto the other. It, it is in the midst of that when he comes, Jesus comes, the second coming, puts his feet upon the earth. Zechariah sees this in Zechariah 14. That's different than the rapture where he never comes to the earth. The church is called up to meet him in the air. At the second coming, the glorious appearing, which is what that is, Armageddon, after the seven years, the end of the seven years, he comes to the earth. And those others are drawn to him. The 144,000, those believers that are alive at the end of the seven years of tribulation that will go in a physical sense into the millennial reign. And then also those other, the martyrs, Revelations 24 through 6, the martyrs that died during the tribulation. And then also the Old Testament saints. All of them will be caught up. Why? Because the thousand year millennial kingdom, though angels will be there, though the rapture church and celestial bodies will be there, though some Gentiles that's turned their heart to God from the seven years of tribulation who are still alive in the physical body will live in a physical sense into the millennium. Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48 spells that out. Also some Jews that have been sealed and, and then others um, that, that were alive in a physical sense from the seven years will live into the millennium. Also, you will have the other Old Testament saints and the martyred saints from the tribulation that rise in celestial bodies, much like the church. Celestial bodies, all of them will be with Jesus for eternity. Where he's at, we're with him. And a thousand years of that will be around the throne, the millennium temple and throne that he sets up in Jerusalem in a physical sense. He sets up in a physical sense, yea, built by the Lord himself. In a physical sense, it's different than the tribulation temple. It will be set up by the Lord himself in the millennium. And we will be with him in celestial bodies. Old Testament saints will be with him in celestial bodies. But then many of the alive living saints, including the sealed 144,000, will live during that time and even procreate in a physical sense when you get into the passage of Ezekiel 40 to 48. So that's that's of that a teaching. That's that teaching. Let me just read this and we'll close with the word of prayer. We'll close with the word of prayer. Some say that the church, the bride of Christ, is resurrected in Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. Well, I've already emphasized, you don't read about the church in, in any of the tribulation passages in the New Testament. You read Revelation chapter 6 to 18, which uh, some people make it more confusing than it is. When you get to Revelation 6 to 18, it's a pretty clean couple of exceptions. Revelations 11 and 13 is a little bit different, but pretty clean. Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is a pretty clean timeline, event by event by event of what happens in the seven years, even to the point of giving you midpoint references, anchoring references 42 months, 1260 days, things of that nature. The abomination, desolation, midpoint, two witnesses killed midpoint. So the, the point is the timeline of Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is pretty clean. That's a chronicalizing of events, sequence of events that takes place over Daniel's 70th week, over the seven years of the tribulation, okay? And, and in that you read the seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and the seven vile judgments. God's 21 judgments that makes up God's wrath, the wrath of the land that he pours out. Taught on that extensively. Go back and watch the lessons. Pulled up very easily on the same page. Okay, people say that the church goes through that. Well, very easily. Many references proves to you in the Bible the church does not go through the wrath. God, not one place in your Bible. Not one place in your Bible will you find that when God pours out his wrath to punish, he never punishes the righteous with the unrighteous. Abraham challenges him on that very point concerning Sodom, concerning Lot. God never punishes the righteous with the unrighteous. Now, 
God does draw back his hand and allow the sinful consequences of mankind to wrongfully affect the righteous. But when God pours it out and the seven seals, the seven trumpets and the seven bio judgments come from God, God pours those out. God never will punish the church as he pours out his wrath upon the earth. The church is not here for the seven years of tribulation. You read in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, which goes through and speaks to the church age, okay? You read the, the word church and churches 21 times. Go back and check me. Keep the preacher honest. You read the word church and churches 21 times in the King James Version Protestant Bible in those three chapters. In the tribulation passages, Revelation 6 is where the tribulation begins with the first seal. That happens immediately after the covenant of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Okay, when you read the tribulation passages, Revelations chapter 6 to chapter 18, you don't read the word church mentioned one time. Not even one time. The church is not present for any of that. The church is not present for any of that. Praise the Lord. If you have a question, I want to encourage you to study your Bible. Study all of these passages. And, and I'm not trying to sell a book to you or to anybody, but I have a, about a 310-page book on end-time prophecy. The Lord's helped us to put it together. It's been professionally done, gone through by a publisher a couple times, actually. And the um, publishing house puts it together and prints it for us, copyrighted, ISBN number, all of that. You can get it for $30. I don't make very much of anything on it. I don't sell it for that. It has hundreds and I would say thousands of Bible references in it. It, it is a picture of end time prophecy from the current events we're looking at until time no more, heaven and hell. It takes you through the whole journey. And we, uh, if you would like one, you can go to our church's website, hopeapostolicupc.org, click on donate. And when you click on donate, it's $30 plus $8 for U.S. postal shipping in the continuous continental um, United States. Beyond that, we'll ship it to you, but it may cost more for shipping. We'll give you a quote. And so it's $30 plus $8 for shipping. And just put in your name, your shipping address for the U.S. Postal Service, and just put on there the unveiling so we'll know what it's for. It's not just a donation, but, but it's to buy the book. And we're in the midst right now of working with a couple different entities. It will be a trusted within the next month or so, listed on Amazon and many other entities to sell. And um, we've been giving great favor in those arenas. So it's going to be, I, I feel like, probably our most broadly circulated book up to this point. And others are coming by the grace of God. Um, and pray with us. Pray with us. I've been contacted within the last three weeks, two different podcasts. Um, both of them actually on the West Coast, believe it or not. Um, they want to have us on and and host a Zoom podcast with us concerning prophecy in this book. So I feel very good about that. And uh, just trying to get the word out there. Why am I so driven by prophecy? Well, because as a minister in this day and hour, I think we do a grave disservice to people if we don't focus on end time prophecy. I think many, many pulpits um, need to do a better job with that in, in my biblical opinion. Secondly, I think we must keep people at the edge of the coming of the Lord with an open, clear view of heaven, hell, judgment, eternity, and Calvary. And thirdly, we study upon prophecy so we would be stirred to make a call in an election shore and to be compelled to reach others, have an urgency in the hour to resist the spirit of apostasy and immorality and to rise and to be the Christians that, that God's called us to be, but by His grace. That's why I do these things. I'm honored to do it. You have anybody in this community Southwest Florida, please direct them to us. Saint that does not have a church, a backslider, somebody that has questions, a rank, dirty, heathen, homeless, prostitute, it matters not. We'll do a diligence to help every single one the same by the grace of God. Direct them to us, pastordagan at gmail.com. Please pray with us, share these ministries, share these lessons, invite others to join us, and pray for us. My wife is praying over you. She prays all over all of my teaching. And she's an intricate part. She's the second olive branch with me. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your grace, for your love, and for your mercy. Touch all of us to grow. In thy word, help us to be humble. 
Help me, God, to be apt to teach all men. Help me, God, to have a pure spirit. Let me measure my words. I know, God, it's your word, but God, it flows through me and my vocabulary and other ministers. Let me teach with the humility, with the purity, with an unfeigned faith, God. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord God, we humbly pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Bye now.